Welcome to Back to the Bible Radio, featuring best-selling author and internationally known Bible teacher Warren Wearsby. When Paul wrote to the church at Thessalonica, he had a heart that was just filled with gratitude. In chapter 1 of 1 Thessalonians, verse 2, we give thanks to God always for you all, making mention of you in our prayers. Then he goes on to tell them he's thankful for their testimony, for their witness, for the assurance that they have of their salvation. Chapter 2, verse 13 of 1 Thessalonians reads like this, For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when ye received the word of God which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. Notice what he calls the Bible, the word of God. This is one title that is used throughout Scripture, the word of God. No other book can make that claim. I have a library of some 8,000 volumes, but the only book in my library that can claim to be the Word of God is Scripture, the Bible, this book that we are studying right now. And I like that name, the Word of God. We hear so many words today. We hear words over the radio and television. We hear a multitude of words as we walk through the store or down the street. There are times when I just get off by myself, I don't want to hear anybody say anything. I simply want to be alone. Early in the morning, I like to go into my study and open my Bible, and there I find the Word of God. This is God's Word. Now, the fact that it is God's Word lays a tremendous responsibility upon us. We know Jesus Christ as our Savior, We've trusted him. He has saved us. The Holy Spirit has come in to live in our lives. And we have this book. And we have a threefold responsibility to the Word of God. And this threefold responsibility is spelled out in 1 Thessalonians 2.13. Let me read the verse to you again. For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when ye received the word of God which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of man, but as it is in truth the word of God which effectually worketh also in you that believe. Responsibility number one, we must appreciate the word of God. Notice what he says. You received it not as the word of man, but as it is in truth, the word of God. You don't treat the Bible the way you treat any other book. Now, I realize that paper and ink and leather or cloth, uh, these are material things, and in that respect, the Bible is like any other book. But, oh, it is not like any other book when it comes to its quality, when it comes to its origin, when it comes to its basic characteristics. We must appreciate the Word of God. Don't treat your Bible the way you treat any other book. I want to show respect to the Word of God. You know, it used to be centuries ago that when they were going to read the Word of God, they brought the Bible forward and they laid it on the pulpit and the people stood as though the king were walking in. Well, this is the word of the king. We must appreciate the word of God. Don't treat it the way you treat any other book. It's not the word of men. It's the word of God. In its origin, it's the word of God inspired by the Holy Spirit. This was not invented by various religious people. This book was written inspired by the Spirit of God. In its contents, it's the message from God. This is the word that God wants us to hear. When you open your Bible, God talks to you. As to its character, this book is the word of God. It is holy. It is true. It has power in it. Oh, appreciate the word of God. In recent weeks, I have been studying once again Psalm 119. Whoever wrote Psalm 119 certainly loved his Bible. He said he'd rather have the word of God than have honey. 
Psalm 119, verse 103, How sweet are thy words unto my taste, yea, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Would you rather have the word of God than have food? Job said, I esteem the words of thy mouth more than my necessary food. Jesus said, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Uh, the prophet Jeremiah said, Thy words were found, and I did eat them. They are the joy and the rejoicing of my heart. Would you rather have God's word than have food? Would you rather have the word of God than have money? Psalm 119, verse 72. The law of thy mouth is better to me than thousands of gold and silver. How about verse 127? Therefore I love thy commandments above gold, yea, above fine gold. Verse 162, I rejoice at thy word as one that findeth great spoil. So here's a man who really appreciated the word of God. He'd rather have God's word than have food. He'd rather have God's word than have money. He'd rather have God's word than have sleep. That's interesting. Uh, verse 147 of Psalm 119, I prevented or anticipated the dawning of the morning and cried, I hoped in thy word. My eyes prevent or anticipate the night watches that I might meditate in thy word. Here's a man who stays up late, gets up early. For what purpose? To read the word of God. Now, how about you? You say, oh, this is the word of God. I'll defend it. Do you get up early enough to read it? Would you ever miss a meal to be able to go to a Bible study? You know, you announce in the average church that you're going to have a Bible study, and a lot, not very many people will show up, but you announce a banquet, you announce a free meal, people will be there. Why? We'd rather have the uh, food than have the Word of God. And not many people want to set their alarm clocks early enough to get up in the morning and read the Word of God and meditate on it. Our first responsibility if we really believe the Bible is the Word of God, our first responsibility is to appreciate the Word of God. Our second responsibility is to appropriate the Word of God. For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when ye received the Word of God, which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the Word of men, but as it is in truth the Word of God which effectually worketh also in you that believe. That's what Paul wrote in 1 Thessalonians 2.13. Now, in the original Greek language, he used two different words for received. The first word translated received, when ye receive the word of God, which ye heard of us, is a word that just simply means to uh, accept something, to take it. Uh, it. It talks about the hearing of the ear. But the second receive, ye received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth the word of God. That second word receive means to welcome, to receive as a guest, to receive with dignity and honor. In other words, they didn't just hear the word of God with their ears, they heard the word of God in their hearts. They received the word of God inwardly. The word of God is food. Our Lord compared it to bread, didn't he? Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Now, you can look at the bread, you can smell the bread, you can weigh the bread, you can handle the bread and starve to death. The bread has to be received inwardly. The word of God is compared to honey. It's compared to meat. The meat of the word of God is compared to milk. As newborn babes desire the unadulterated milk of the word... Now, this all has to be received inwardly. That's what our Lord meant in John chapter 6 when he said, except you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no life in you. He was not talking about uh, the communion service. He certainly wouldn't discuss communion with a group of unbelieving, hostile Jews who finally turned their back on him and walked away. No, he was talking about receiving him through the word. The uh, statement is made very clearly there. Jesus said, the flesh profits nothing. It is the word, the spirit that gives life. Peter said, thou hast the words of eternal life. How do you feed on the Lord Jesus Christ? By receiving his word. We have to appropriate the word of God. In Matthew 13, 9, the word of God says, he that hath ears to hear, let him hear. 
Take heed that you hear. And then in Mark 4.24, he says, Take heed what you hear. This is why my radio and TV stay off so often. Take heed what you hear. What you hear goes into your mind and your heart. And I find that some things, when they go into my mind and heart, they make it difficult for me to receive and enjoy the Word of God. When you go to church to listen to the Word of God, how do you hear? Do you pay attention? Do you give your full attention to it? Or do you sort of let your mind drift and your thoughts drift away? We must appreciate the Word. It is the Word of God. And we must appropriate the Word. It is the Word of God. When you appropriate the Word of God, you are appropriating the God of the Word. It's through these exceedingly great and precious promises that we become partakers of the divine nature. You say, oh, I want to be more like God than appropriate more of His Word in your heart. There's a third responsibility. Not only must we appreciate the Word of God and appropriate the Word of God, we must apply the Word of God. Notice now, this Word of God which effectually worketh also in you that believe. We don't just appreciate it and say the Word of God is a marvelous book. We don't just appropriate it and take it within us. We must practice it. We must apply it. The Word of God works. This word work in verse 13 of 1 Thessalonians 2, is is our word energy. The, The word energizes. We'll be speaking in a later study about the word of life, the energy that is released by the word. When God wanted to create the universe, he spoke his word. When God wants to accomplish things in this world, he speaks his word. His word has divine energy and power in it. Now, when you and I believe the Word and practice the Word, it goes to work in our lives. Faith in the Word of God leads to obedience. And obedience and faith release power. Luke 1, 37, For with God nothing shall be impossible. God can do anything. No Word of God is without the power of fulfillment. Our Lord spoke to a paralytic and said, get up and walk. The man believed that word, he got up and walked. Our Lord said to a man who had a withered hand, stretch out your hand. The man did it, and he was healed completely. Now, the Lord Jesus Christ, through his word, releases power. But this comes by faith. The only way to uh, release the power of God is by faith. If you've got a problem in your life, you find some promise in the Word of God that applies to that problem, believe it, act upon it, and God's power will go to work. Yes, this book is the Word of God. That means we can trust it. And when we trust it, God releases his power. No Word of God is without power of fulfillment. Now, is the Word of God at work in your life? Is the Bible a book that sits on the table? Is the Bible a book that you carry in your hand two or three times a week to go to church? Or do you appreciate the Word of God? Do you realize that this is a priceless treasure, holy Bible, book divine, precious treasure, thou art mine? Do you appreciate the Word of God? Now, people can tell whether or not you appreciate the Word of God. Uh, They can see your Bible. They can see how well it's been used, how it's been marked. They can tell whether or not the Word of God is really important to you. Do you appropriate the Word of God? Not just hear it with the ears, but receive it into the heart. Do you feed upon this Word of God? Is it your inner nourishment? Do you meditate on it? Meditation is to your soul what digestion is to your body. And the only way we can grow is by meditating on the Word of God. Finally, do you apply the Word of God? This Word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. When we apply the Word of God by faith, God goes to work in our lives. Yes, this is the Word of God, but it cannot work in your life and mine unless we believe it and step out by faith and obey what the Word of God has to say. 
Paul is writing to his friends at Philippi in Philippians chapter 2, and he admonishes them in verse 14, Do all things without murmurings and disputings, that ye may be blameless and harmless, children of God without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation or generation, among whom ye shine as lights in the world, holding forth the word of life, that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. Paul uses an interesting description of the scriptures. He says, holding forth the word of life. Now, he is admonishing us as believers to live godly lives in this present world. Uh, this present world is twisted and crooked and perverse. Uh, one Greek scholar translates it morally warped and spiritually perverted, and it is. It's a dark and twisted world in which we live. I'm speaking, of course, as far as the spiritual life is concerned. God made a beautiful world as far as nature is concerned, but sin has gotten things into darkness, and things are twisted and morally warped. Now, we Christians are here in this world to make a difference and to show the difference. We're not to be complainers. We're not to be arguers. We're supposed to be blameless and harmless. We're supposed to act like the children of God. We're supposed to hold out the word of life. Now, verse 16 of Philippians 2, holding forth the word of life, can mean one of two things and possibly both, holding fast to the word of life. In other words, don't lose it. You're in the middle of a world that would like to rob you of your Bible, and the world will do this very subtly. All you have to do is get interested in some uh, pastime, get interested in something on television or radio, let your mind get uh, drifting away, and before you know it, you've lost your hold on your Bible, and your Bible's lost its hold on you. But it also means to hold it forth, to offer it to others. Now, of course, the two go together. Unless you are holding on to the Word of God yourself, you can't offer it to anybody else. What is the answer to the problems in our world today? It's the Word of God, isn't it? Not just honoring the Word of God, but heeding the Word of God and doing what it says to us. Well, why should we offer the Word of God to others? Because it's the Word of life. We're living in a world that is dead, and we're living in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. And we offer to this world the Word of life. But what does that mean? Why does Paul call the Scriptures the Word of Life? Number one, he calls your Bible the Word of Life because it has life in it. I have a large library of some, oh, 8,000 volumes. And I must confess to you that many of those books are dead. I mean, they're dead when you read them. They've been dead for many years. I keep them as reference guides. I use them occasionally. But there's no life in them. I don't mean by this they aren't exciting or they aren't educational. They cannot contain spiritual life. Now, your Bible has life in it. It is the living Word of God. You know, the Lord Jesus said, uh, it is the Spirit that gives life. The flesh profits nothing. John chapter 6, verse 63. The Spirit gives life. The Holy Spirit of God inspired the Word of God, and the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of life. And there is life in your Bible because it came from the living God. When that crowd turned and left the Lord Jesus Christ in John chapter 6, our Lord turned to his disciples and said, Will you also go away? And Peter replied in verse 68, To whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. You see, the only word that really has life in it is the word of God. The angel said this in Acts chapter 5, verse 20. The apostles had been arrested and put into prison. The angel came and let them out and said, Now you go into the temple and you preach the words of this life. What life? The life that Jesus Christ can give. And of course, we all know that familiar verse in Hebrews chapter 4, it's verse 12. For the word of God is living and powerful 
and sharper than any two-edged sword. But take that first phrase, the Word of God is living. Why? It comes from the living God. It is inspired by the Spirit of life. You and I are the children of the living God. Heaven is the city of the living God. The church is the temple of the living God. Your body is the temple of the living God. And this book is the word of the living God. It has life in it. No other book can make that statement. No other book can make that claim. Now there are some very important implications from this. If the Bible has life in it, then it cannot really be destroyed. Oh, over the centuries, people have tried to do away with the Word of God. They've tried everything. They've tried burning it and suppressing it. They've tried burning the people who uh, uh, produced it. They passed laws against it, and it's still here. The Word of God is living. And because it is living, it really cannot be destroyed. Because it is living, it is relevant, meaningful, to every time and every place. Now, that can't be said of every book. There are some books that uh, just would not be meaningful to some people in different parts of the world or at different stages in history. But the Word of God, because it is living, is relevant to the needs and the problems and the concerns of people at every stage in history, at every stage in life, in every place on the world. That's remarkable. When I was a little child, I read my Bible. didn't quite understand all of it, but I read it. When I became a teenager and trusted Christ as my Savior, I read my Bible, and it, it spoke to me, to, to the needs of a teenager. When I was a seminary student, later on when I became a young husband and then a father, this same book spoke to me. Why? Because it is living. It is relevant to every time and every place and every stage in history and every stage in life. You never outgrow a living book. Thanks for being a part of our Back to the Bible listening family. It's wonderful to have you with us each day. If you missed part of the program or you'd like to listen again, please visit us at backtothebible.org to catch up on our audio studies. Backtothebible.org So be sure to come back again for more wisdom from God's Word. Back to the Bible, leading you forward in your relationship with Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ.